Hi, welcome to our first Friday series of watch parties about all things Belle Isle and the Detroit River, especially as they relate to the greater Great Lakes. I'm Sandra Swoboda, the Program Director of Great Lakes Now, and I'm so happy to be able to talk about some of my favorite topics and places with all of you today and with my good friend, Anna Marie Seisling from WDET, Detroit Public Radio. Hi, Anna. Hey, everyone, and hey, Sandra. Yeah, we have had some really great text threads in the last <laughs> few weeks. We've been sending each other pictures of our Detroit River adventures, and even in the winter, it's really great to see that we're both getting out there. Even though it's cold, and it can be hard in the winter, but it's really important to get out there, bundle up, and go. So, Sandra, what are some of the outdoor things that you've been doing? Right, yay us. <laughs> uh, let me get my parka, my winter hat. Um, we have been taking our dog, of course, on a lot of hikes uh, at Rouge Park, which is also in Detroit. It's named after the Rouge River, which it runs right through the park. Uh, it's a waterway that's going to figure into this watch party with our topic of coastal wetlands. Uh, we also head out with the dog, of course, to Belle Isle as much as possible. In fact, today, I'm hoping to join some friends there after this watch party, despite how cold it is now. Perfect. That is so great. So you're kind of living your work. And um, I really relate to that, too. It's been fun. And, you know, I hope our audience here knows the Belle Isle Conservancy is a co-sponsor of our watch party. And we're so grateful for that. Yeah, we get to live our work, as you said. Uh, I think it counts as work time every time I go out to Belle Isle. Uh, <laughs> Even with my dog, I think, you know, I can count that as work. Oh, yeah, there is my dog oh, keeping an eye on the koi gosh. pond. Looking hungry, too. Jeez. <laughs> I swear he did not eat any of those kois. But I did tell him that they're actually those goldfish are an invasive species mm -hmm. around the Great Lakes. We've talked about goldfish um, in our a couple of our previous watch parties. So. Um, you know, I, I, I hope that uh, people can go back and watch that. Actually, we'll put the link in the chat there. So Anna, though, you know, as funny as that picture is, like you have won the unofficial competition for, uh, for, for uh, pictures and text threads of, of Belle Isle. So let me uh, see if we can get a little video you shot. Zach, our technical producer, can, can put that up. Uh, Anna very meanly texted me to the other day of a sight she saw in the river. Well, so was, Anna, make us jealous. Talk about this. Yeah, it was really crazy. So it was one of those days I'm sure so many of us can relate to working from home, hadn't left the living room like all day. And finally around six or so, my partner and I were like, we got to get some fresh air and get out of here. So we went to Belle Isle, checked out the ice. It was a beautiful day. All of a sudden I see this like brown blob and I'm like, what is that? And lo and behold, it's two bald eagles. And, you know, I had seen bald eagles on Belle Isle many times, but never on a big ice flow like that. It was such a cool, again, just made me so happy that I did bundle up, went out there and, uh, yeah, weathered and toughed out the, the winter weather so I could see those guys. Looking at the Detroit River, the connector waterway as part of the Great Lakes. Uh, you know, after you sent me that, we headed out the next day around sunset. Mm -hmm. And I hoped to replicate that, which I did not. But we did get a, I did get this photo of my dog in front of one of my favorite places on the island. So Zach, can we show, there he yeah. is. Oh, the so Belle Isle cute. Aquarium. <laughs> well, of course the Belle Isle Aquarium there is part of the Belle Isle Conservancy, which is a partner here in this series of watch parties on First Fridays. That's right, we also have a pretty exciting new co-host for this watch party. A big warm welcome to the International Institute for Sustainable Development and their experimental lake area. So they're based in Canada and they are a new co-host for this watch party series. Sandra, you've been there. Why are they such a great fit and a good partner for this? Well, first of all, the Experimental Lakes area is totally amazing. It's a series of inland lakes in the remote wilderness of Canada where scientists do research on those lakes. Since it's a closed system, they can actually do experiments in the live environment, the real environment, and see the impact of things like climate change, like algal blooms, like even oil spills that they've replicated. So they have scientists on staff and they do research in a lot of the areas that we talk about. So we thought it'd be fun in the future to have some of their scientists on to talk about some of these issues that we are talking about as related to Belle Isle and the Detroit River, and today, Lake St. Clair and the Rouge River as well. 
Amazing. It sounds like it's going to be a great fit. I'm excited. So as uh, you know, our Facebook audience knows, thank you all so much for viewing. I really love these watch parties because it gives us a really real live time opportunity to loop you in and bring you into the conversation to answer your questions, hear what you are thinking about and seeing and experiencing when it comes to wetlands in the Great Lakes region. So if you do have a question or something that you want us to bring up during the the conversation today, please leave that comment or question in the chat in the watch party on Facebook. Yes. And as you, our loyal audience know, you don't just get to ask questions of uh, Anna or me, you get to ask from our guests who are the experts. So today's guest I want to get to now, her name is Marie McCormick and she is the executive director of Friends of the Rouge. Marie, welcome to the Great Lakes Now WDET Belle Isle Conservancy, and now Friends of the Rouge Watch Party. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm excited to um, chat, answer questions from both of you and from the audience. So thanks so much for having me. Amazing. Thanks so much, Marie. So, well, you've been kind of patiently waiting while Sandy and I have been sharing our wintertime uh, <laughs> adventures. So now I want to introduce you to the audience a little bit. So for people who might not be familiar with your organization, um, what is Friends of the Rouge? Your name refers to the Rouge River, right? Yeah, you got it. So we are a nonprofit organization that was started in 1986. We started as a grassroots group that was really interested in cleaning up the Rouge River. So um, Rescue the Rouge um, used to, so it started in 1986, but um, there was a, a, an organization that started in 1970 in response to Earth Day. It was just cleaning up the river. So our organization has grown over the last three and a half decades, 35 years this year, um, to include stewardship, education, monitoring, river access. We do all the fun things that bring people to the river and get them to know a little bit about the river and ways they can steward it in their own backyard. Tell us a little more about the Rouge River. I think we have a map and we can kind of do a locator of where it's positioned. And then I'm gonna ask you to talk about not only the Rouge, but like how you're connected to Detroit River and, and the Belle Isle Conservancy, because they, as you know, they're a co-sponsor of this event. Sure, if you wanna pull up that map, I'd be happy to chat about it. So the Rouge River watershed is a, is a basin where all the water flows to a low point. In this case, it's the Rouge River. It's a 467 square mile Rouge uh, River. We serve 48 communities, um, including a large section of Detroit. Um, and we are one of the largest tributaries to the Detroit River. Um, I believe adding at least 50% base flow to the river at that point. Um, and in regards to our participation in the Detroit River Coalition, so back in 2019, um, a number of river facing organizations, both on the US side and Ontario side, all came together to promote some conservation issues um, uh, around the diverse natural and cultural heritage of the Detroit River from sort of a bi-national perspective. And Friends of the Rouge is involved um, because of that, the size of our tributary. Um, but we, in 2019, came together around the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And we intended to do this like giant cleanup across the whole like area. Well, of course, best laid plans, COVID hit, and just before Earth Day, we had to scrap that planning. We did pivot to a hashtag campaign, which is called the E Earth Day Pledge, where you swapped an everyday item to something more sustainable, like um, a plastic straw to a metal straw, for example. Mm. Um, but this year, um, they're doing a comprehensive strategic planning process, of which Friends of the Rouge is playing a role in. Um, it's being led by the Belle Isle Conservancy. Um, but um, yeah, we're, we're going to do some uh, events this year, maybe a couple of sites near Fort Street Bridge Park. If anyone listening is, in, is um, familiar with that project in Southwest Detroit, um, doing some blight removal and trash removal and things like that. So we're really excited to be part of that coalition. I think it's really important to not just look at um, the U.S. side, but also kind of looking at it in a binatural, binational perspective. So um, we're pleased to be a part of that, that work. Yeah. Well, great chatting. I, I, I always learn a lot when we do these watch parties and, and we are actually gonna have an announcement related to the cleanup days uh, in the next couple of weeks about a new project and participation and partnership we have going. But I wanna get back to the title 
of our watch party today, which is about coastal wetlands. Marie, what can you tell us about coastal wetlands in general and then specific to the Rouge River? Okay, so wetlands are the place where water um, kind of covers the soil or is present at either um, or near the surface of the soil for varying periods of time in the year. That might include the growing season. So um, the water saturation level determines how the soil develops and the types of plants and animals that um, you find living there. So wetlands support both aquatic and terrestrial species um, and the prolonged presence of water creates conditions that favor the growth of specially adapted plants and um, kind of create the characteristics of wetland soils. So there's two different, there's several different types of categories of wetlands. So you have coastal wetlands or tidal wetlands where like the sea mixes with the freshwater, kind of think of the Everglades um, or like the, the Great Lakes coastal wetlands where the areas are directly influenced by one of the Great Lakes or the connecting channels like the Detroit River. Um, and then the Rouge is kind of like an inland or non-tidal wetland. And that is like um, wetlands that are isolated, depressions, um, so you might see them um, on the edges of rivers. We call it kind of like riparian wetlands. Um, so that can include like marshes, bogs, um, wet meadows, things like that. And they're, they're very diverse and varying. Um, but wetlands are the most productive ecosystems in the world. They're really compared to rainforests and coral reefs. Um, and so although only 5% of the um, surface in the U.S. is wetlands, they contain over 31% of all plant species and support 43 plus percent of federally listed endangered or threatened species. Um, they're rich habitat for amphibians and uh, a large majority of the birds. So, and they, besides just being these amazing habitats, they provide something that's really beneficial to humans, which is flood control. They help clean water. Mm -hmm. They help provide houses and homes for wildlife. Um, and unfortunately, Michigan has lost over 60% of its wetlands. And in Wayne County, where the Rouge really sits, over 90% of our wetlands are gone. That's a huge loss. Um, and so I, I, I can talk more about wetlands if you're interested in <laughs> questions, but um, they play such an important role mm. in the health of our watershed. And, um, and, and I'll leave you with this, wetlands are like the kidneys of our ecosystems. And if you had both of your kidneys removed, you wouldn't be doing so well. Wow. Wow. All right. Le leaving it there. I'll think about trying to think about kidneys in terms of the kind of like uh, <laughs> ecosystem anatomy yeah. of this region. That's so interesting. So um, I'm also thinking, I mean, mentioning uh, wildlife, there are also some really significant um, man-made structures along the Rouge. One of those is, of course, Fairlane. Uh, that was Henry and Clara Ford's house. So what's going on in the Rouge River around that area? How are we seeing the development kind of play out there? Well, thanks for asking. That's such an interesting, awesome project that was funded through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Um, and it, um, so the project is complete. It was over a $2 million project um, and it was managed by Wayne County. Um, so the idea was to circumnavigate the existing um, historical dam to create an uh, over 800 foot fish ladder or passageway that kind of circumnavigates around. Um, but the fish ladder, it was a project that was identified by the Rouge River Advisory Council as a critical step in eliminating some of the environmental impacts, um, uh, impairments that were identified in, uh, as uh, an area of concern. So it's, it's um, the dam itself is a fairly national historic landmark, and so they didn't want to dismantle it. So instead, um, to kind of fix the problem of fish not being able to migrate upstream, um, they did this fish passage. So it basically helps reconnect 50 miles of the Rouge River and over 108 tributary miles to the Great Lakes. So fish can get back up into the Rouge for the first time in over a hundred years. Very wow. cool project. Um, and I will say, so the, the project is there, but the folks who run it um, are very, um, want to pass the mes message along that during the time the vegetation, which is critical to the project developing, please stay out of that area. 
when there's um, when you're able to get into the area, they they will let you know. Um, it's a it's a really nice area, kind of in a, um, behind Aniamos and Dearborn. Mm. Um, and so any foot bicycle traffic can really cause degradation to the area and impede the natural restoration. And so we really ask people to be respectful of the habitat um, and do not enter the project area. So, mm -hmm. got it. Yeah. Um, Anna, you actually did a story this week on another Ford site in the Metro Detroit area that has uh, a, a restoration project going on as well. I know we have a, a the web page version of your story, but people can go there and listen. Can you tell us about that story and what that project is about? Sure. So that's actually, I have to admit, uh, selfishly, that is that is why I asked you, Marie, about uh <laughs> about what we were seeing at Fairlane on the Rouge. Yeah, so I spoke with Kevin Drodos, who uh, is an invasive specialist with Ford House. He told me that along Lake St. Clair uh, and Gross Point Shores, they actually have this uh, kind of rare situation there, which is that they are in possession of like a full continuous mile of shoreline there. And they got funding, so they are going to be kind of launching this preliminary study that's going to allow them to really figure out what it would mean to get rid of that hardened shoreline, remove that crushed concrete, and create something that is kind of like rewilding that uh, area of the Lake St. Clair shoreline, which is pretty exciting to hear. You know, it's not, like Marie said, not just the shoreline itself, but also creating these kind of wetland areas too. And uh, the hope is that it's going to be really beneficial beneficial for local wildlife there. Interesting. Well, we'll be all be following that project as it goes along, along with all of these on the Rouge River as well, uh, aiming at some habitat restoration that we can all experience from the water. So Marie, uh, you've been working on some programs there at Friends of the Rouge that have helped people get out and see the projects right from the river in kayaks. So can you tell us a little bit about that project and, and that event? And we uh, have some video from those as well. We'll ask you to narrate a little bit. Oh, sure. I'd be happy to. Um, so in 2020, um, something happened and we weren't able to host a traditional Rouge on cruise, which we normally do, um, which takes people in the Diamond Jack up the Rouge River. Um, it's normally uh, narrated by either Dr. Oren Gelderloos or Dr. Paul Drouse. Um, and we really wanted to honor the spirit of that event. And so we created a five part Rouge Uncruise series, which takes you on a journey starting at the mouth of the Rouge River at Zug Island, going up. Um, each segment kind of hits a different piece of the river and it ends at the Henry Ford Fairlane Estate, which you just we just sort of talked about a little bit. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you, if you want to check it out, you can go to our website, you can check out our YouTube channel. Um, and I mean, it's seven hours of content. So if you want to sit down and really learn about the Rouge, this is content for you. Um, so, and you can see right here on the right, that's the, um, a natural sulfur spring. This is on Zug Island. Um, it's remarkable that this has continued to exist, but it is a natural feature that um, is a really cool and interesting point of interest on this trail. So, mm -hmm. and then this part right here you see is the Hubble Southfield um, combined sewer outfall. This is, um, I believe at one point it was, but I believe it still is the largest combined sewer outfall in the world. Um, it's uh, very successful in managing combined sewer outfall, so raw sewage discharging into the Rouge. And um, it was a very expensive project, a great infrastructure project that was funded through the Rouge River Wet Weather National Demonstration Project um, that was ushered in, in part, through the late John D. Dingle, who was very instrumental in bringing dollars to restore the Rouge and some of the Great Lakes region. Okay, so cool to kind of get that kayak perspective, especially right now being in, you know, the middle of winter. Nice to see blue skies and remember that things will thaw. Um, so Marie, as the executive director of Friends of the Rouge, I'm wondering how do you work to help people in kind of understanding this deeper relationship between wetlands and a healthy environment? Um, like you said earlier, so rainforest, coral reefs, I mean, these are really kind of classically beautiful natural landscapes, wetlands, I think a lot of people look at them and kind of think, ugh. So I'm wondering, how do you kind of communicate the importance of wetlands and get people excited about them and understanding all that they offer, especially on the Rouge River? 
Well, you know, that's a really good question. I think that um, the work that we do really helps bring people into the fold. Um, we have easy entry points for engagement and we feel that bringing people to the river and experiencing it is going to develop a sense of love, a sense of um, um, sort of place that, you know, just hearing about it or like seeing a picture of it isn't going to do the same um, for you. So um, one way you can get involved with Friends of the Rouge and kind of develop that deeper sense um, of place for the Rouge is to participate in our Frog and Toad survey where we teach you the sounds of frog and toads that you can find in the Rouge. And actually we teach you all the sounds of all the frog and toads that you can find in the entire state of Michigan. And frogs are kind of like um, these little sensitive biological indicators. When you hear certain frogs, you know that um, a habitat that you're in is really healthy. Mm. So we have our first part available for free on a Zoom um, a, a Zoom event on Saturday, February 20th. And then we have the second part, which, um, so the first part's an intro and the second part is like really teaching you how to do the survey. But we have hundreds of people that participate and even people outside of the Rouge watershed who are really interested in learning about frogs and toads. Um, and to be quite honest, that's one of our, um, we call it our gateway projects. Mm -hmm. So people get interested in frog and toads. It's something you can do with your family, socially distanced. Um, you go out at dusk and you listen for the presence and absence of frogs and toads. So um, last year was a um, hallmark year for participation in our program because, hey, what else are you going to do with your with your family? <laughs> Let's go listen to frogs and toads. So it's really fun. Um, a really cool program and Sally Petrella, our monitoring manager, is just fabulous. So, we will put a link to that event in the chat. Anna, boy, if I've ever heard an NPR story in the making, it's, I'm Anna Marie Seisling out here with the frogs and toads and then cue the natural sound and your microphone yeah, right. on the frog. Right. Right. <laughs> exactly. You gotta be really quiet because so, I'll hear you. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, well, I do want to remind our Facebook audience that you too can ask questions, type them in the chat if you have any. But as you can see, Anna and I can quiz Marie all day about her work with the Friends of the Rouge. So Marie, I want to, you're, you've talked a lot about projects that are underway. I want to ask you about kind of a forward looking one. You um, mentioned earlier the Oxbow project. Can you talk a little bit about that? And I think we have uh, a rendering also that um, that aerial photo and then a rendering of what that's about. So I'm happy to announce that the oxbow is complete and they did a ribbon cutting with um, all the project partners and we were present, although we were not um, in charge of the project. That was a, a project that was ushered in through Wayne County, the Henry Ford, the Alliance of Rouge Communities, uh, so many different funding sources. Um, but they made the final cut um, and cut the ribbon in 2019. And uh, Debbie Dingle was there as, or uh, I think Senator Stabenow was there to help cut the ribbon on that one. Um, but the amazing part about this, this Oxbow is that it acts as like a, um, a hotel or a respite on the Sahara Desert that is the concrete channel. So you can see in that image of the concrete channel and maybe we'll get to talk about that in the future, but the concrete channel was put in in the late seventies to help mitigate the flooding that was a result of the um, construction of the Fairlane Mall. And the Fairlane Mall, that location was one of the last remaining giant wetlands in the area. So we are paving the wetland now we're creating this concrete channel in four miles of what used to be a 5.8 mile river. And so now, fast forward into the future, now we're spending more dollars to um, go ahead and fix that. Um, not only are we doing the oxbow, which helps the fish as they're moving upstream towards the rest of the, the Rouge um, tributaries um, for habitat, for rest, for food, for breeding, all of that, and the ecological restoration that happened there is really helping spur economic redevelopment. It's helping to create a nicer quality of life for the people that live there, not just the habitat for the, the animals. And um, gosh, it's such a cool project um, mm -hmm. to go in there, to paddle in there and to see 
how quickly the light, like life wants to live, it rebounds. Mm. Um, before they started the, the oxbow 20 plus years ago, there were two species of fish in that oxbow and they were deformed. And now you have uh, over 60 species of fish that you can find in there. Wow. There's an incredible story of um, environmental revitalization. We have bald eagles nesting. I, we were, I was just walking down there yesterday. I saw a kingfisher, blue herons, all different kinds of amazing wildlife that's returning because we're taking the time and we're investing in restoration projects that are just absolutely vital to our community here in Southeast Asia. Oh, that's so amazing and really touches me to hear these stories of nature's resilience. And you're so right that life does continue. Um, so we do have a question coming from Karen Grade. Karen wants to know, how many species of amphibians do you have? I'm assuming maybe she means uh, in the Rouge River along those wetlands. I know, Marie, you had said these are really, uh, as far as biodiversity, really kind of rich environments. Any idea, though, of how many species of amphibians? Um. I, I'm not the I am not the expert to answer that question. That's a great question, and I would love Sally Petrella, our monitoring manager, to answer that. I do know we have eight species of frog and toad in our watershed, um, but I believe there's 14 across the state of Michigan. Um, in terms of other types of amphibians, salamanders, etc., um, I don't know the answer to that. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, well, we can certainly get an answer to that, um, and we'll put it in the Facebook chat. So um, thank you for that question, Karen. We like we do kind of like when we stump ourselves in this watch party too, because it pushes us to learn more. So we'll get the answer and we'll put that in the chat as well. Um, you can still ask questions in the chat, but I do want to show our virtual field trip on coastal wetlands, which may spur some questions and also provide answers about what is actually going on uh, with some of the other kinds of critters. So let's go to that virtual field trip. Compared to sandy beaches and giant sand dunes, this may not look like much, but don't be fooled. This habitat is one of the most important in the Great Lakes region. Oh, you don't believe me? Well, good thing we're taking a field trip. Before we get into why this habitat is so special, there are two important questions to ask. Number one, what is a habitat anyway? And number two, where is my guide? We'll break down question one while I go solve question two. To put it simply, a habitat is a place where an organism or a community of organisms live. Some habitat types might be easy to spot, like a beach, which is technically the zone extending from the water's edge to the limit of the highest storm waves, or dunes, which stabilize and resupply beach fronts with sand while supporting a diversity of plants and wildlife all their own. But the Great Lakes region is vast, and there are hundreds of different coastal habitat types that are less known, but just as important. One of those can be found in the Metzger Marsh Wildlife Area, just east of Toledo, Ohio. I met with Matt Kovach there. He is a coastal program manager for the Nature Conservancy. He works as part of a team restoring wetlands on the edge of Lake Erie. And that means he knows this habitat as well as anyone. Matt, thanks so much for meeting with us. So could you explain to us what are some of the defining characteristics of the Great Lakes wetlands? Sure, so Great Lakes wetlands are really, really important in special places. Mm -hmm. There really aren't many of them left. Yeah. We've lost about 95% of our wetlands in the state of Ohio. They provide really, really important wildlife habitat for fish and birds and mammals and all sorts of things. You know, th there's a lot of food there. There's a lot of, pla a lot of habitat, a, a lot of homes for different types of animals that live out here. Uh, a lot of things that migrate, a lot of birds that migrate from south to north and north to south. Can you show us some of your favorite parts? Sure, come out with me, I'll show you some All of these right. cool places. Let's go. So these are the coastal wetlands that are on uh, the southern shore of Lake Erie. Okay. And these are some of those habitats I told you about that are those really important coastal wetland habitats in the Great Lakes. So this is one of our really common wetland plants up here. It's called uh, either American water lotus or yellow lotus. It's got a bunch of common names. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's, it grows really well in, you know, about three foot of water. And we wow. find it kind of fringing in a lot of those between the shallower areas of a lot of our marshes and the deeper areas that are kind of dominated by the, um, some of those submerged aquatic plants that we'd seen earlier. 
So this is a muskrat hut. This is one of the mammals that li likes to live out in these areas. And what they do is they build their homes like this, build these mounds up, and they'll have a little compartment inside of there that they'll use as their, you know, as their living room, and they'll stay in there all winter long. <laughs> their living room. It's so complex. All those different things. And so what kind of things do you think from out here or do you think are made up in this nice so, little nesting place? So there's a lot of plants that they use to construct these. Most of it is cattail, and that's okay. a plant that's growing right this here. right here? You. Yep, exactly. Oh, wow. A lot of it is that. There's some smartweed growing on it too. Uh, smart and they'll weed. smart weed, and there's some other plants that they'll uh, they'll use. They'll use that combined with mud that they pull up from the bottom to basically build this whole structure. And if you could, if we could see inside of it, you'll see that it's it's kind of hollowed out. There's a big open area inside of there, right, right. and there's actually an entrance right here wow. on that side that they'll use to uh, to go so inside. So what of about it. the cattail is so unique that they use so much of it? It's so significant. They love cattail. Right. It's a food source. It's one of their Ooh. favorite foods, and that's why if you look out here, all these dead uh, these dead sticks sticking up yeah. is basically cattail strands. If you look right over there, you can see one that's kind of been chewed up quite a bit. Um, that's probably from the family muskrats that live right in All here. All right, so they're going out for dinner. It's one, exactly, it's All one right. of their favorite foods. Matt, thank you so much for showing us Metzger Marsh. It's beautiful out here. And I think we understand a little bit more why preserving habitats like this is so important. So thank you for being one of the people that helped to preserve sure. it. But no that's the end of our field trip. I'm Morgan. Thank you so much for coming along with me. We'll see you next time and we will be back. Okay, good. All right. <laughs>
Just look at the Fairlane Mall I was talking about. That's essentially a dead mall. It's in bankruptcy. That's 8,400 parking spaces. And there's the, the Hyatt there that's an 800 room hotel that's completely empty and will probably never re resurrect itself mm -hmm. once it's glory in the 70s and 80s. Um, and the consequences of doing that is the removal of these huge wetlands that even if you do rec uh, do recreate them in the future, they're never going to be the same. You have, you have thousands of years of um, uh, ecological development that is just, you know, paved over in an instant. And um, so it just kind of begs the question of how is our society really thinking about future plans and development, not just for in, an immediate economic gain, but for sort of long-term sustainability, not only for our immediate future, but for our children, our grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's something that I wrestle with every day. And I, I look at my five-year-old daughter and my three-year-old son, and I think, what kind of future do I want for them? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, I really appreciate you bringing up that kind of multi-generational approach. And my only hope really for us as a species is just that most of us or more and more of us will continue to kind of rise up and think about it's not just my generation. It's not just me right now. What about, you know, seven generations down the line? How can we be, uh, you know, kind of the the kind of stewards for our land and for our, our future ancestors, really? Um, Marie, thank you so much for joining me and Sandra this afternoon. This was great. So next month, we will continue this conversation about wetlands and we'll visit Belle Isle specifically and we'll have Amy Emmert, who is the Director of Education at the Belle Isle Conservancy. Uh, we're also going to do more with our new partnership with the International Institute for Sustainable Development. So follow along with us on Facebook to see more about all of that. Yes, all of us will be posting links uh, in our social media, whether it's Twitter or Facebook. You can follow Great Lakes Now, you can follow WDET, and you can follow the Belle Isle Conservancy. And we'll put links up to our new partner as well, the International Institute for Sustainable Development. They've got some great resources about wetlands, so we'll put those in the chat if they're not there already. You can follow WDET on Twitter, on Facebook, um, and thank you so much. And Marie McCormick, you are the Executive Director of Friends of the Rouge River. Thanks so much for being with us today. And if people want to learn more about your group's work and efforts, where can they go to find out more? You can go find out more about our organization at www.therouge.org. And thank you so much for having us on your show today. It's been a true pleasure. Yeah. Thanks again for coming. I want to thank everybody behind the scenes who makes this possible. Mary Ogilvie at the Belle Isle Conservancy, Meta Stangy at WDET, and our Colleen O'Donnell and Zach Allen, who are basically executive producing behind the scenes here as well, and our new partner, Sumit Bath from the International Institute for Sustainable Development. We will see you in our next watch party, or maybe you will catch Anna or me out on Belle Isle. <laughs> and hopefully we'll all get to see some bald eagles. Thanks so much for joining us. <laughs>